Else, your time has expired. Senator Dean Natale. Thank you, Mr. Deputy uh, President. Um, well, this debate has been, I say, uh, let me say, a, a very, very frustrating one, full of huff and bluster, lots of hand wringing, lots of finger pointing. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. It's the state's. It's the Commonwealth's responsibility. It's Labor's fault. It's Liberals' fault. Um, I think what's forgotten in all of this is what this actually means for patients. Um, let's get back to what this actually means. It means the closure of the emergency department in Colac overnight. It means that in the Peter James Centre in Burwood, where people are waiting to get into a bed so that they can have rehabilitation from their stroke, they can't get one. It means that when a hospital like the Austin Hospital doing such, such great work um, and originally budgets a $2 million surplus, it suddenly finds itself with a $4 million deficit. And spokespeople reporting that that means 800 fewer operations at that hospital in order to make those savings. It means in Barwon Health the closure of a number of beds at Geelong Hospital. It means potentially the closure of more emergency departments. Peter McCallum, the closure of 16 beds announced in February. It, at Royal Melbourne, the, the um, uh, effectively uh, cuts to 700 operations at the Royal Children's Hospital and Northern Hospital. Uh, a series of planned expansions being cut. Uh, what this whole debacle means is that people who are waiting for urgent treatment um, are no longer going to get it. So when you strip away all of the huff and the bluster, the finger pointing, the hand wringing, the it's your fault, no, it's your fault. Um, uh, what you forget is that this is an issue that affects people's lives. Um, so we've got to fix it. How are we going to fix it? Well, let's work out what's actually happened first. Um, and it can be summarised in a few short sentences. We have seen state governments underinvest in our public hospital system, particularly in the states of Queensland and Victoria. Um, that is, I think, not in dispute. But we've also seen the sudden withdrawal of funding by the Commonwealth government uh, from the public hospital system. It's a very simple proposition. A number of state governments underinvesting in health care, and then in December this year, we see the Commonwealth government pull out $1.5 billion over the forward estimates. And when you've got a simple proposition like that, how is it that we um, hear these sort of arguments being put forward um, that allow uh, uh, both the state and federal governments to escape their responsibility for their share of the problem? Well, the lesson is if you muddy the waters enough, uh, you can get away with saying or doing anything. So let's, let's strip this back. The, in question time today, we heard Senator Conroy say that the Commonwealth share of hospital funding is increasing. Absolutely right. He's absolutely right. But that's not the relevant point. The relevant point is that the states are now, funded, are now uh, are confronted with the proposition that they are going to get a reduction in funding compared to what they were promised. So sure, the Commonwealth share of funding is increasing, but it's increased by less than what was promised to the states. That is effectively a cut. If I negotiate a pay increase with my uh, employer, I go out, I take a mortgage based on that new pay increase, and then a year later the uh, find out I can't pay the mortgage because the employer says, well, I'm not going to give you as much as I said I was going to give you. I gave you a little bit more, but you're not going to get quite as much as I promised you. Well, that's a cut. That's what's happened here. Now, why have they done it? Why have the Commonwealth cut back on funding of hospitals? Well, the uh, answer's a little more complicated, but not much. Um, what it's done is it's based its reasoning on a change in population. Now, the government's argument is population hasn't changed much and therefore we are not going to increase the funding as was promised. It's able to get away with that claim because what it's done is it has compared a pop two different population data sets. In 2011, the census changed the way it would ultimately establish a population number. So there was a change between 2006 and 2011 in the way we estimate population. What the government's done is, rather than comparing like with like, 
It is essentially compared population changes, one using the old approach and one using the new approach. That is a maths 101 error. It is a straightforward mistake, and it is despite the recommendations from the ABS, the Australian statistician, that we should be comparing like with like, that we should be using the new population estimates and comparing those using the same data set. And by doing that, the government has been able to strip away $1.5 billion of funding that was promised to the states over four years. Sure, it is going to increase its commitment, but it is still a reduction on what was promised. The other uh, part of this equation is this thing known as the health price index or health inflation. Now, health inflation is um, another measure that determines how much money is being paid by the states. Unfortunately, we've got a health price index or an inflation measure that doesn't actually reflect the cost of uh, running a hospital. The health price index brings in all these other costs that are absolutely nothing to do with running a hospital. And that's why we've got, for example, uh, our, pub, our private health insurance premiums going up by 5 per cent based on, based on health inflation. And yet, when it comes to public hospitals, we've got a health inflation figure of 0.9 per cent. Despite the fact that wages have gone up by in the order of uh, 3 per cent, which is the, by far and away the biggest cost of running a public hospital system. So we've got two important factors here. We've got the population data, which is wrong, and we've got the health inflation index, which doesn't reflect the cost of running a hospital. And on the back of those two things, the Commonwealth's pulled out the money that was promised to the states. But worse of all, if that wasn't bad enough, what it decided to do was halfway through the financial year. Hospitals got their budget planned, worked out how many operations they're going to do, got staff employed, got everything lined up, being good corporate citizens. Halfway through the financial year, the government says, guess what? We're going to pull away some of your funding. You need to find savings. Not just that, we're not going to pull away just this year's funding. We're going to go back the year before and in Victoria take out $40 million from the previous year. So, again, to take the analogy of uh, the pay cut, you negotiate a pay increase with your employer. He comes back a year later and says, guess what, I'm not going to pay you as much as I said I was going to pay you. But even worse than that, I'm going to deduct pay from the year before. That's what's happened here, and it's not acceptable. What is welcome is that the government in Victoria decided to restore $107 million worth of funding. That is absolutely welcome. But it's continued to play the politics here. Rather than doing what it should do and give the money through its own agreed national health reform agreement, which is a central funding pool uh, jointly owned by the states and the Commonwealth, it's decided to bypass the states, undermining its own agreement, and fund the hospitals directly. So it can continue playing this ridiculous blame game. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. No, it's your fault. Not good enough. What we've got is a situation now where we don't know how the money is going to be paid to these hospitals. Who's going to oversee it? Are they going to get it in a block? Is it going to be paid out in dribs and drabs? How's that money going to be paid? We've got doubts over the constitutional validity of how that money should be paid. We know that some of the money is not coming from additional Commonwealth spend, but in fact we're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. We now know that some of the money that was originally allocated to Victoria for national occupational health and safety reforms is going to go to plug the shortfall. So what we've seen is an effort to continue the blame game rather than a genuine effort to resolve the issue. The responsible approach would have been, look, we misinterpreted the ABS data. We've got an ABS, we've got a health inflation index that doesn't reflect the cost of running a hospital. We're going to fix it. We're not going to fix it by this short-term political fix here in Victoria. What we're going to do is we're going to restore funding to all states, and not just for this year, but over the forward estimates. That is the right thing to do. In the end, it's people that miss out. It means that somebody who was going to get their hip done next week might not be able to get it done for another six months. It means that the kid with asthma who's in an emergency department might not be seen now. They might need to wait two hours, three hours, four hours. The only uh, little ray of light in all of this is that we are going to move to a new way of funding our hospital system. We're going to get an independent umpire. It's two years away. 
It couldn't come soon enough because this spectacle has been particularly unedifying. 